teacher held me back, back from class and he said, Bonnie, I need to speak with you. That's never a good thing. So he said, I need to speak to you because you take up a lot of space in this room, in your classroom. I need to speak to you about your white privilege. I'm like, my what? He's like, yeah, your white privilege. You take up more space than everybody else in this room. You share your thoughts, your opinions. You're always talking about whatever you're sharing, your knowledge. But I don't think you realize the white privilege you have. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think you understand. I do not have white privilege. You know, I grew up on an Indian reserve. I went to a high school where everybody in my high school was of a different ethnic background. I was the token white girl. I spent my life fighting for equality, giving people a space that deserved a space, their voice a space, uh, uh, their, their, um, I gave, I celebrated people's differences and embraced our togetherness, what we had in common. He was obviously mistaken. Out of anyone in that room, I was not the person with white privilege. I didn't get it. And I thought, oh, hang on a second. He thinks that I grew up with privilege, like I have a silver spoon in my mouth. I've had opportunities that other people haven't had, and I'm like, no, 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 no. You are so wrong there as well. My mom was, had a dual diagnosis between mental health and addiction. I mentioned I grew up on a reserve, not a lot of money there. And my dad was an absent father, and I lived out on my own at 17. Trust me, there was no privilege. Sorry, there was no silver spoon in my mouth. I didn't have privilege. I didn't have opportunity. You got it wrong. I don't have white privilege. And this really, really upset me, like to the core of my being. Because he said that I was that thing that I knew I wasn't. I knew I wasn't. It broke my heart. You know, my first boyfriend was Filipino. My husband is West Indian. In fact, I didn't even really date white guys. Okay, there were a couple that slipped in, but you know, we're all allowed to make mistakes, right? <laughs> but that, you guys gotta get it. That's how I felt. I actually, growing up on the reserve, one thing I learned, I learned about what the white man had done. And I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna be that. In fact, when I was 16, I went to the movies and I saw Mississippi Burning. I don't know if any of you saw that, but I went, it was about the South and, and um, segregation and just all the most horrific things that were done to the, to the blacks in the South. And I remember going to the bathroom and looking at myself in the mirror and saying, you're disgusting. It's disgusting what being white has given you. I've been able to ride the coattails of all the other people ahead of me. And I didn't want that. I didn't want it. So I fought this thing being white because I was really clear I wasn't white like all the rest of those people that are white. I was different. So you can kind of get why I was really offended when my, my instructor said this to me. So, given that this is kind of an important issue to me, I had to do some inner work. And I had to understand what was he talking about? And it was then that I began to realize, not on my own, I had to talk to a few people, but I began to realize that my privilege 
had nothing to do with who I was. It had nothing to do with my beliefs. It had nothing to do with where I was raised, nothing to do with my mom, nothing to do with anybody. It actually had everything to do with how I was born. I happened to be born white and really white. Like, I'm the kind of white that you can see the blue veins popping out kind of white. That's how white I am. No matter how many times I fake and baked, or how many perms I got, <laughs> I was as white as it got. Like, ah, oh, okay, so I'm white. But with that, I got opportunities. Opportunities that I never, ever worked for, but were assumed just because of the way I looked. It was assumed I grew up in a middle class family, that I had certain, I was a certain way. In fact, I think I was a certain way because I was raised that way based on being white. My mom, in fact, the way she spoke to me and the things she taught me were all based on my whiteness. For example, policemen are my friend. Anytime I was in trouble, I know I could go to a police officer and ask for help. They would be there to help me. In fact, any time I'd come to a restaurant or go to a store, was, of course I was going to get good service. Why wouldn't I get good service? That's ridiculous. I didn't know that the world I lived in was based on my appearance, my outward appearance. So, what I do with that? I can't change it. And I know I'm not a racist. I know I, what my internal beliefs are. So what do I do? Not wanting this hasn't changed anything. Resisting it, fighting it, denying it. So then I realized it's time for me to be accountable. Time to be, to be responsible for this. So one of the things I get to do is I actually get to have microphones in my mouth, or not in, that would be weird, but really close to my mouth. <laughs> and I get to share and talk to people. Because what happened was my mom raised me with a certain confidence. Now, I don't know if that's just my out upbringing or if that also had to do with me being white or if it was a blend of both. I don't know where it begins and where it ends. But I know deep within, deep within, that I've had opportunities people didn't, other people didn't have. For example, when I think back at the reserve, my cousins, my stepbrother, my stepsister, when they had to deal with the adversities, such as my adversities, they didn't have the same opportunity as me. They didn't get the benefit of the doubt. My husband was always told, you have to work 150% as hard as any white person to get ahead in the world. I was never told that. I just was. So, my name is Bonnie Duarte, and I have white privilege, and I get to talk about it. Thank you very much.